Hey, you're listening to Sean the South. We're coming to you live, getting podcast airwaves and the radio all around the nation. That music you're behind right now is Songs from the Road Band. Songs from the Road. I'll read you a little bit of our mail tonight, a little bit of our mail. Emily from Alabama writes, Sean, I just wanted to type you a quick note and say thank you. My morning coffee is usually accompanied by your podcast when it's cool enough. We sit outside and listen to the phone like an old radio. I think it is possible that our hound dog even listens too. I live in Alabama and I think I may appreciate it a whole lot more with your stories because it becomes more and more home with each story that you tell. Joni Wilkerson, Shawnee, Kansas. My mother is a retired school teacher, and she has this fascination with old radio shows. She listens to them all the time on YouTube. I'm not sure how she found your show, but we listened to it as a family one night, and we're all about it. I just wanted to see if you'd say her name over the air. That's really it. I don't have a funny story or any shameless news to share that'll make people cry. I just want my mother's name, which is Vicki Robertson. To be read over the air, just say something like, Hi, Vicky. Dear Joni, thank you for the kind words, and you got it. Hi, Vicky. Philip Rendering, Sacramento, California. Sean, it's funny that I'm emailing you because I don't do things like this. I never do. But I just thought, since you read stuff before your shows, that I'd email you and tell you that I have a daughter who introduced me to your show, and she's nine years old. When she first listened to your show, I was like, who is this guy? Who is this Sean guy? And she was like, here, listen, Dad. And so I went listening with her, and 
We were on the way to soccer practice with five other girls her age, and they were laughing and they were giggling. I don't know how she got into your show or bluegrass music for that matter, but I'm originally from Wisconsin, and I just want to say thank you from a northerner to a southerner for giving my daughter something cool to listen to that isn't garbage. Laura Hayes, Easley, South Carolina. Dear Sean, I'm a 23-year-old farmer and a stay-at-home mother to my first child. My one-year-old son, as I write this, he's screaming in my left ear. It's been a long couple months between calving season and baby viruses and renovating our new home and working on crops and the loss of my favorite dog last month. Needless to say, I feel gross and grubby and unlike myself most days, but your show and your writing are a big part of what make me feel a bit more like my old Southern Belle self once again. I love hearing you talk about Southern cooking, especially because I love to cook, and I miss having the time to do it instead of rushing, rushing, rushing all the time. So thank you for writing from the heart and for writing for the soul and for talking about the South. We love you, and I definitely get a kick out of your show. It never fails to make me smile. Thanks again, Laura Hayes. Dear Laura, thank you for that letter and from everybody here tonight. Thank you to all the farmers of America. Gene Donaldson, Pensacola, Florida. You're not going to believe this, Sean. You're not going to believe this, but I saw you in traffic 10 minutes ago while I write this on my phone. <laughs> you were in your truck riding just beside me, and I told my husband, hey, that's Sean Dietrich. And you were lost in your own little world, and I even saw you singing with the radio. I expect it was probably Hank Williams. I thought maybe I'd see your dog beside you, but she wasn't there. Anyway, just wanted to say, hey, I saw you. I saw you in person. I had never listened to your show before until today. I found it while I Googled you, and I guess it ain't all that bad. <laughs> Dear Gene, thank you for that enormous compliment. And this is me waving at you waving at you from behind the glass window of the radio. Steve Gustav, Houston, Texas. My father was mowing the lawn yesterday and he almost had a heat stroke. It was no joke, we brought him inside and he was just totally out of it. I was so worried we were gonna lose him. I kept snapping my fingers and asking him to tell me his name, but he couldn't do it. I was so freaked out, it was so bad, Sean. When I asked him what his name was, he said, my name is Benjamin Franklin. His name is not Benjamin Franklin. Anyway, he woke up today feeling perfect and he wanted to go mow again in the front lawn and my mother threatened to kill him with a chef's knife if he even left the living room. He's resting today and I just want to say that I'm so thankful that he's okay. I don't know why I'm telling you this. He don't listen to your show. I do sometimes though. Anyway, I love my father and I just wanted to tell somebody. Dear Steve, I'm so glad you told somebody and I'm so glad that somebody was me. Jordan Belcher, Sioux City, Iowa. Dear Sean, you make me want to travel south real bad. Every show I listen to, I think, man, I'm going to go south one of these days. The furthest south I've ever been before now was Missouri. But now I'm really wanting to go travel the back roads, Alabama, Georgia, and all that kind of stuff. I'm planning on making a trip this coming week. I hope you're well. I just wanted to drop you a line because you're always asking people to do that after your show's over, and I thought to myself, I'm just going to do it. This next message was signed, Miller Light Fanatic, Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> Hi, Sean, my real name is Jacob, but I figured you'd be more apt to read my letter on the air if I made my name funny or something, and so because I like Miller Light, I changed my name to that. My story's a long one, so I won't bore you with the whole thing. What I will tell you is that my son has just left for college and I know I'm supposed to miss him, but I really don't. <laughs> don't get me wrong, I'm proud of him. I'm so proud of him and I love him. I love him big time, but I finally feel like my work on earth is slowing down now that he's starting to stand on his own two feet. Yesterday, I went fishing for the first time in a few years because I actually had time to do it. Anyway, I thought you'd appreciate that. Come to Birmingham sometime, brother, and let's go fishing together now that I finally have a little bit of free time. Dear Miller Lite Fanatic, a.k.a. Jacob, you got it, brother. Randall Johnson, Chickasaw, Alabama. Sean, my wife's turning 30 today, and she is everything to me. Everything. Can you give her a shout-out and just tell her how much I love her? Her name is Jolene, just like the song. 
fact, sometimes I sing that song to her, but I have a terrible voice. I'm so lucky to have a woman who gave me two boys, two boys and a good life and a home I look forward to coming back to at the end of every work day. I wish I could write like you. I wish I could write something beautiful for her, but I can't. So all I can do is send it in and hope that you'll read it. I feel like I could die a happy man with her by my side. She's 30 years old, and if you think about this, that's really pretty young in the big scheme of things. She feels like she's getting old, but she's not. She's the best person I ever knew. She's the sweetest person anybody has ever met. Read this on your show if you can, please. She listens to you religiously. Dear Randall, from Sean Dietrich, who isn't anything in the big universe compared to the love that you have for your wife, you write beautifully. And that letter you just wrote to me was one of the nicest I've ever read. So from everybody here tonight, happy birthday to your wife, Jolene. Happy 30 years, and here's to 70 more. Happy birthday. And that's letters from our listeners. We're going to have another tune from Songs from the Road. Songs from the Road Band, everybody. Back in the days of the Chisholm Trail I went out west looking for my treasure The work was never through The paydays were few And the hard times were truly beyond measure She worked for Mr. Jones at the Frontier Bar Singing cowboy songs every night The other girls could not compare With her sophisticated flair When I saw her there was love at first sight White rose, white rose A beauty like the world has never seen Beneath the dust and the gloom The only flower that blooms Is my white rose of Abilene The saloon was always filled up with outlaws The roughest and the toughest in the West Among the tumbleweed ramblers and the gun-toting gamblers She learned that I was different from the rest We'd sit and talk for hours about getting out Because there was no future for us here Under a buffalo moon I promised her that soon We would find a way to disappear White rose, white rose the world has never seen Beneath the dust and the gloom The only flower that blooms Is my white rose of Abilene Back by the door Across the stage the bullets flew And the next thing I knew Rose was lying cold on the floor Now there's no beauty left in this old cow town The outlaws ran the good folks away There's a crumbling field of stone And a stem that stands alone The white rose that grows from her grave And the gloom, the only flower that blooms is my white rose of Abilene. My white rose of Abilene. Mo 
Oh, it's hot out. Good Lord, it's hot out. All you got to do to figure out how hot it is is walk inside and ask the cashier to Piggly Wiggly. This is where we get all our news and our gossip. This is where we learn everything there is to know about everything. You just walk right on into the Piggly Wiggly. You buy something small, usually something tiny, a little, little bag of cashews, bag of peanuts, a jar of pickles. You walk through the cashier line and you pay for it with cash. We don't do cards very much. And you talk to the cashier just for a little bit. And she'll tell you everything that's going on in town. She'll tell you, she'll tell you who's running around on who, and who's up for the coaching position next year, and who's just about to, who's just about to go off for college and what they're going to study. And this is how you stay informed. This is how you, you catch up with the weather and what's going on and what kind of weather is to be expected. People love to cuss the weather. No, I don't have anything against hot weather. I really don't. Even if it's summer like it is and everything is starting to boil and, and rupture around me from too much dadgum heat, I don't have anything against it. Because it's just the way it is. The world has to repeat itself. It has to turn upon itself and, and make itself better. And after the bitterness of winter, I mean, we have bitter, bitter winters where I live in northwest Florida. Last winter, it got way down to 68 degrees bitter winners. The world has to repair itself. It has to make up for damage due. It owes you. And so it does this by, by making the weather just so daggum hot. So hot you can't, even, you can't even get outside without hearing the locusts scream at you. They're screaming. They're making their complaints known to God. They're cussing is what they're doing. A locust is only programmed with one word, and that's a cuss word. It's not, it's not our kind of cuss word, but it's his kind of cuss word, and that's what he does when it gets hot. They all line up in the, in the branches and the trees, and they just cuss. Cussing the weather is an ancient technique that our ancestors used to do long before electricity, long before we had air conditioners, refrigerators, and even ice boxes. We'd sit outside, we'd cuss the weather, just like my Uncle Jesus sits outside behind his shed with his buddies Vern and Lou, and all they do is talk. They talk like old men talk. Old men don't have to use big, long sentences. All they got to do is use little five, six-word sentences, and they can conduct entire conversations with these fragment sentences, sentences like, huh, well, you know, I'll tell you what I'd do. <laughs> or a sentence like, are you kidding me? Or, what is the matter with the world today? I just don't know. I just don't know. When they agree with something, they like to use a two-word phrase. A two-word phrase you might recognize if you've been anywhere south of the Mason-Dixon line, and that's, that's it. Say, Fred, did you see what so-and-so did to so-and-so? Boy, I tell you, I'm so proud of him. That's it. That's it. It's a, it's a popular phrase. Maybe I... I'm, I'm saying too much. My Aunt Eula, she lives with my Uncle Jethro on the end of a dirt road. The dirt road, the dirt road is a dirt road you have to find through a series of driving connections that lead from, from a labyrinth of rural routes. There's one dirt road leads to another dirt road, leads to another dirt road, leads to a gravel road, leads to another dirt road, which leads over a shallow creek bridge just surrounded by all sorts of trees, longleaf pines, and tall grass groves, and greenery that's enough to blind a man. They live at the end of this dirt road. My aunt Eula has tried to get it paved several times, but the county just keeps putting her off because there's not enough people live out in this section of the world to justify paving it, and so she lets it be she loves living out in the country, so is my Uncle Jether. They wouldn't, they wouldn't make it in the city. You have two kinds of people in the world. You have, you have people who slow down when they see a yellow light, and you have people who speed up. <laughs> my Aunt Eula is the kind who slows down, so is my Uncle Jether. But my Aunt Eula has an aversion to dust. She hates the dust that comes along with living on a dirt road. She hates it so much. She hates dust in every, every form or fashion. She was born with an aversion to dust. She believes the eighth deadly sin is thou shalt not have dust on thy ceiling fans. <laughs> of course, that sounds more like a commandment than a sin, but who's counting? 
She's the kind of woman who loves to go and, and spend days in the kitchen, especially, especially when it's hot out. This makes no earthly sense to my Uncle Jether. She picks the hottest weather on, on God's green earth <laughs> to heat up the tiniest room in the house, and she will get that oven going, and she'll make foods that are totally inappropriate for the summertime. She'll make chili. She'll make chicken soup. It makes no sense. It makes no sense to Uncle Jether. So he goes outside. And he sits in his shed, just outside his shed with his buddies. And that's what he does. He doesn't do anything all day long. She calls him sorry. Sorry. Or they call him, they call him a mess or a character. Would that I could live as long as my Uncle Jether so that people around town would call me a mess. <laughs> There's no higher blessing that a man can receive than being called a mess or a character. My Ella called me, she asked me if I'd take her to the Piggly Wiggly because she, she's had an operation on her eyes and she's not supposed to drive to remove the cataracts and she's just not out of the woods yet. And she felt like cooking. My Aunt Eula is just not at home with herself unless she's cooking something. She makes a glorious pimento cheese, good chicken salad, and banana pudding, and she makes, she makes wonderful pound cake. She's a great pound cake connoisseur. We used to ride with my Aunt Eula all the way to the store, to the Piggly Wiggly, and her, her LTD, her Lincoln LTD, which was roughly the size of a Waffle House. <laughs> and this car was so big, it had the largest floorboards. They were like the Grand Canyon. It could, like, little kids could get lost in these floorboards. Matter of fact, whenever my cousin and I would ride with her to the Piggly Wiggly, we would get lost in these floorboards, and we would find refugees from a long, long time ago, from, from back during the Great Depression, who'd been lost in these floorboards since the 1930s. <laughs> My Eula's car was huge, and she, it was always dusty. It was always covered in a thin film of red dust. She hated that. We'd ride into the Piggly Wiggly, and she would get inside, and she'd forget that she had children in the car with her because we'd be lost in the floorboards. And so she would shut off the car, and, and so... The Bill Gaither on the 8-track would be silenced, and we would be stuck in a hot car while she walked inside to the Piggly Wiggly, and she bought her butter and her flour and her sugar and her shredded cheese and her Duke's mayonnaise and her little jars of pimentos, and then she would get lost and stuck at the checkout aisle of the Piggly Wiggly catching up on gossip. Women like me and Eula have to catch up on gossip no matter where they go. They will talk about the same sorts of things. They talk about who is, is going to run for mayor. They talk about who's running around on who. They'll talk about which hussy is running around with which heifer's husband. <laughs> and she'll hold up the line for a long time, and finally she'd come back out of the car, and she'd find us, find us there, and we would be nearly dead from dehydration. <laughs> so just, just how things went back in those days. I, I showed up to my Aunt Eula's house, and I... I helped her into my truck. We drove along. She picked out the things she needed in the Piggly Wiggly. I helped her. I helped her push a cart, and we stocked her, stocked her little basket with, with things, Duke's mayonnaise, shredded cheese, pimentos, and we checked out. She started to gossip a little bit at the counter, and I just, I just stood near, nearby her and just let her go. That's just how women like her do. It's, it's their natural inclination. And I drove her home. And I turned her loose in her kitchen, and my Uncle Jether, as if on cue, as if on cue, he just walked straight out that back screen door. He let the door slap, and he went out to his shed, and he rang his buddies, Vernon Lou, who showed up post-haste, and they sat out there, and they sweat like dogs. I went to join them, and I saw my, my Uncle Jether. He had sweat through his striped collared T-shirt with the breast pocket, his... His pocket protector was completely saturated. Whenever he put on his reading glasses, they were just dripping wet like he'd been inside a car wash. <laughs> Men like my Uncle Jether cannot tolerate the heat. A man has a hard time tolerating the heat the older he gets. It's a genetic weakness we have. Women can tolerate the heat a lot better than a man, if you ask me. Men, we start to crumble. We start to sweat out vital nutrients out of our skulls. We start to, to lose precious amounts of vitamin B and vitamin D and vitamin C. And then we, we start, to, start to forget what we were saying. 
what was I saying? <laughs> and that's why they conduct these conversations with just, just five or six word sentences. Oh, I'll tell you what I do. I'll tell you what I do, Vern. Yes, sir, I'll tell you what I do. And then they just leave it there. It just hangs right there. <laughs> Vern had just come into a large amount of money. Well, I say large to him. These are people who came from, from parents who had endured the Great Depression. Large amounts of money are completely subjective. He came into $2,300 because he had sold his daughter, Julie's Nissan, which had been parked in his one-car garage. He's had it there for a few years. Long ago, Julie thought she might be moving back to town. But she decided she, she couldn't find a job that was to her liking here in town. She, she graduated from University of West Florida with a degree in marine biology. And there isn't much of a call for a marine biologist way out in, in the country. And so she left. She went to Pensacola. She has a job working in a bookstore now. She left her car at home because a Nissan just does not fit the profile of a marine biologist. A marine biologist is meant to drive a, an SUV or at the very, very most a a Prius that is lime green with big bumper stickers on the back about saving, saving the raccoons or the whales. He sold her car and Nissan for 2300 bucks, and he didn't know what to do with the money. He said, I just can't figure out how to spend it. My Uncle Jetha rubbed his jaw and he said, well, I'll tell you what I'd do. I'll tell you what I'd do. And it just kind of died right there. And these men just, they, they started to speculate on how they would spend $2,300. $2,300 is, is a large sum of money to men like this. These are old men. Old men. Old men who come from people who did whatever they could to endure the hardest time America had ever known. They used to go fishing. And they would save their fish guts after they cleaned their fish to, to feed their chickens. And then they would save their chicken scraps after they had truthed the chicken and, and cooked it for supper to fill up their fish traps and bait their trot lines. These are men who, who are not wasteful men. This Mr. Vern, he just looked around and he said, I, I just, I feel wasteful spending it on a fishing boat. I feel wasteful spending it on anything like, like you know, an addition to the house or anything like that. My Uncle Jether, he came up with a brilliant idea. It wasn't the kind of brilliant idea you'd expect from a guy like my Uncle, Uncle Jether. It was an idea that was born out of him almost sweating to death and losing precious amounts of vitamin, vitamin D out of his skull and sweat. He said, why don't you just give it away? Give it away. Well, now, they thought about this. They thought about this. $2,300 is a lot to give away. Who do you give it to? And, and what, do you, what do you give it? What cause do you give it to? They decided they would start with their friends. They'd go to Miss Fred, Fred Rudder's house. Fred Rudder lives on the edge of town. He, he wears overalls every day of his cotton-picking life, and he can't breathe very well because he was involved in a fertilizer accident a long time ago, and it's left him tethered to oxygen. He inhaled all sorts of fertilizer that ate up, ate up his lungs and so when night came around, they all piled in my Uncle Jesus' truck, three old men, three old boys, and they drove to Fred Rudder's house, and they, they went on his porch, and they left a $100 bill, $100 bill on the porch, and they left it weighted with a Budweiser can. <laughs> Vern did it. He did the honors, and after he left that $100 bill, he ran to his truck, and he just screamed, and he hollered. He, he nearly got stuck in a, in a divot in the road while he was trying to jump into the truck and almost sprained his ankle. He screamed and hollered. And Uncle Jesus hit the gas and they ran so fast away that they kicked up a rooster tail of red dust behind them in the night sky. And they, they went on. They went on. They went on to Robert Bryson's house. Robert Bryson is a man who lost his wife 65 years a few weeks ago. 65 years they've been married. Of course, they fought like cats and dogs, Miss Anna Lou and <laughs> Mr. Bryson. They fought like cats and dogs, never got along a single day in his life. He was the kind of man who would always, always have a scowl on his face. But my Uncle Jether, he always had a tender spot. He always had a tender spot for Mr. Robert. And so 
Vern hopped out of the car. He limped on his sprained ankle, and he trotted up to, to Mr. Bryson's house, and he left that $100 bill on the porch, and he weighted it down with a Budweiser can. <laughs> they gave away $2,300 in one night, one night, and they got home late. It was about 3 in the morning. My Aunt Eula, she was livid. She said, where have you been? And then she smelled his breath. <laughs> Very strange, she could not smell any liquor on his breath, thus none of this made any sense at all. Normally stupid things and late nights were accompanied with, with strong smelling breath. Monk Jesus woke up the next morning and he felt good. Something very strange to him after waking up after a long night out in the truck with his friends, Lewis and Vern, he felt good. He felt good. Normally he had a hangover. <laughs> but this was a nice feeling. That same day, my Uncle Jesus got a phone call from Brother Merle at the Baptist Church. My Uncle Jesus answered the phone. He said, he said, what is it? That's how he answers the phone. <laughs> Brother Merle said, hey, I, I heard about what you're doing. I heard about the things you, y'all are doing, the, 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 the thing you, you got going on. <laughs> my Uncle Jesus said, what are you talking about? My Uncle Jether has not darkened the doors of a Baptist church since 1952 when his daughter got dedicated. And on that morning when his daughter got dedicated, she screamed like a banshee when she discovered that she would have to live the rest of her life as a Baptist. <laughs> my Uncle Jether feels much the same way about it. He's not like my Aunt Eula. My Aunt Eula is a Southern Baptist tried and true. If you cut her, she bleeds Bill Gaither red. Uncle Jesus said, how in the world did you hear such a thing? Brother Merle said, well, I was walking into the Piggly Wiggly just yesterday. <laughs> he said, okay, okay, call it whatever you want, Jesus. But I have an anonymous donation in my church, and I just don't know what to do with it. The church is so, so small. I feel like perhaps you know who needs help more than I do. I'm going to donate it to your cause. Well, now things were getting serious. Now things were getting serious. Now he felt like he had the blessing of the Baptist church, and this was highly uncomfortable to him. This was highly uncharted territory here. He walked to the back of the shed. He and Vern and Lou, they all sat and talked, and they felt very, very uncomfortable among themselves. Their five- and six-word sentences had turned into four-word sentences. They couldn't figure out what they were going to do. They weren't sure they'd accept this money or not. Because accepting that money felt a whole lot like being ordained. <laughs> and men like Jether and Lou and Vern ought never be ordained. They drove on into town together to do what old men do. They sit at Mr. Valentine's, Mr. Valentine's place. They drink coffee and occasionally they'll order something light to eat, but mostly they just drink coffee. They can sit for hours drinking a dollar cup of coffee and talking about nothing and everything at once. Mainly they just like to gossip. They talk about who's running around on who and which hussy's running around with which heifer's husband. <laughs> Mr. Valentine came to their table and he said, Afternoon, boys. Afternoon. This morning I walked into the Piggly Wiggly I just uh, heard about what y'all are doing. <laughs> My Uncle Jesus said, you heard what? Miss Valentine said, look, I-, I got this girl. She just started working for me. Her name's Caitlin. She had a baby when she was 18 years old. She's a nice girl. She moved here into town to, to live with her boyfriend. He-, he works at the paper mill. He has to drive an hour and a half to work every day. And it leaves her without a car. She walks to work. She walks to work, and I just feel bad about her doing that, especially since it's just so hot outside. He said, I, I, have, I have a car that I'd like to get rid of, but it needs a new transmission. He said, I'd like to, I'd like to go in with y'all. <laughs> Jether looked at Vern, and Vern looked at Lou, and Lou looked at Jether, and Jether looked at Vern, and Vern looked at Lou, and Lou looked at Mr. Valentine, and they said, what are you talking about? He said, I'd like to get the transmission of my car fixed, and I'd like to donate it to her. He said, the only thing is, is times are tight, and I figured y'all, since y'all come into a whole lot of money somehow, I figured y'all could help me out. 
Well, Uncle Dether said, listen here. Listen here, Mr. Valentine. We ain't involved in no such charitable work like you might have heard at the Piggly Wiggly. And we don't care that much about mankind. We don't care who, who gets help and who don't get help and who's suffering. I, we feel that mankind needs to, to, to find his own way in this world. We, we honor men who are able to pull themselves up by their bootstraps without asking for charity. But we do know where we can get $600. And so, they donated a car. They donated a car with a brand new refurbished transmission to a girl named Caitlin who has a, a little tattoo on her left forearm of her baby that she had when she was 18 years old. She woke up one morning and she went out to her driveway and she found a car just sitting in her driveway. And she looked in the front seat and there was a title. She drives around town in that car and you can see her driving around town in that car if you... If you're in the right place at the right time, she's on her way to work. She wonders where it came from, but that's only because she's new here. That's only because she's new, because everybody here, when they see her drive by, they know exactly where it came from. They know who it came from. And that's because all you have to do to know anything in this world, all you've got to do is to walk right past the sliding doors of the entrance to Piggly Wiggly. Thanks for listening to Sean of the South today. I've been your host today, Sean Dietrich, and it has been a bona fide pleasure. If I do say so myself, hope you join us next week and the week after that, because it's a true privilege to come to you guys via the radio and via the podcast airwaves. That music here behind me today was Songs from the Road Band, a North Carolina bluegrass powerhouse feature Mark Schmick, Charles Humphrey, Ron Cavanaugh, Sam Horton, and James Schlender. Collectively, these guys have received top accolades in the bluegrass, Americana, and jazz genres. If you don't believe me, how about a Grammy, for example? They'll be touring heavily in support of the fourth studio album they just cut, Road to Nowhere, part of which you just heard on this broadcast. Find anything more about what they do, visit songsfromtheroadband.com and pick up a copy of their album if you get a chance. To find anything more about what I do, visit seanofthesouthshow.com and that's where you can find clips and episodes of our past shows dating all the way back to our very first show which sounds like we had absolutely no idea what we were doing because guess what we didn't and while you're there i hope you drop my line send me your birthday announcements wedding invitations bar mitzvah announcements grandparents birthday invitations announcements church social announcements and any other thing you can think of sad stories funny stories or any story you'd like read over there and i'll do my best to read it over the air if i am so inclined because i love to do that sort of stuff for my friends and speaking of friends friends remember to eat well when you're out there on this road life because if you should starve half to death twice you'll be dead adios Uncle 